My name is Ken McAllister, and I'm the Associate Dean of Research and Program Innovation in the College of Humanities. I'm also a faculty member, right alongside uh, one of our earlier speakers today, Jonathan Crisman, in the Department of Public and Applied Humanities. I'm pleased to say that this department is a proud collaborator with the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture on a new BA degree in Applied Humanities that's focused on spatial organization and design thinking, subjects that are at the heart of today's event. The College of Humanities has long been a locus for reimagining space and doing transdisciplinary, transcultural collaboration. From its early collab, uh, one of UA's first dedicated collaborative computer classrooms, to its new Center for Digital Humanities, which routinely combines computing power, visual design, and attention to lived, felt experience. Among their many activities, Center for Digital Humanities researchers create virtual worlds that help tell vivid, often multicultural and multilingual stories about people and places otherwise lost in time or erased through divisive politics. Arguably, these are digital environments that help us restruct better physical environments by facilitating the recollection of others' complex lived experiences in community. It's therefore my honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker, Veronica Smith, whose career has been similarly forward-looking and attentive to the human minds, bodies, and spirits at the center of built environments at every scale, from the nano to the global. This orientation to the social good is unsurprising given her academic pedigree. Ms. Smith earned her Bachelor of Architecture degree right here at the U of A in 1991, where she also received the American Institute of Architects Henry Adams Medal as the top-ranking graduate in the Bachelor of Architecture program. Ms. Smith went on to practice architecture for five years in Seattle, where she started her first business focusing on the intersection of architecture education, and environmentally friendly design. This work led her square into the 1990s tech boom, during which she was able to parlay her skills for connecting technical advancement and human need. For five years, she helped develop and deploy innovative new hiring, training, and coaching practices in the tech sector, working in particular with software developers telecommunication engineers, and financial professionals. Intrigued by the transformative capacity of the emerging technologies around her, Ms. Smith returned to school and in 2005 earned an MS in electrical engineering from the University of Washington. Her work there in basic neuroscience and its cutting edge tools for understanding human brain structure and function opened the door to an entirely new field, not only to her, but to the world, data science. Ms. Smith went on to do pioneering work in basic and applied research and evaluation before eventually founding Data to Insight, an evaluation and data science consulting firm in 2010. For nearly a decade now, Ms. Smith has led a five-person team at Data to Insight that facilitates the strategic measurement and evaluation of primarily STEM education, training, and workforce development programs, which, if you happen to have been at last week's NSF Broader Impacts Workshop, you know is both incredibly difficult and incredibly important. Given her, expert, her extensive expertise, experience, and commitment to keeping human beings at the center of built environment planning, not to mention her refusal of siloed thinking, Ms. Smith is the ideal voice to conclude today's restruct sessions and help us expand our collective imagination about our future collaborations. Will you please help me welcome Veronica Smith. 
Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Dean McAllister, for that gracious introduction and the warm welcome that I've received today. I'm thrilled to be with you um, and add my voice to the Restruct Built Environment. I think I need to turn this off. There it went. Is that better? OK. Um, it's really been fascinating to listen to the visions and ideas that have been exchanged today. Um, a few that I heard that really excited me uh, were Professor Adkins' talk about community knowledge and the built environment and uh, the net zero research consumption model that was presented, as well as Professor Henry's knowledge network uh, ideas. And um, our team has been uh, mapping social and organizational networks for interdisciplinary efforts over the years, and they have been very informative to initiative development. To wrap up, I've been asked to share with you a little about why diverse interdisciplinary teams are vital to the creation of multicultural learning communities um, and to creating resilient communities. As the talk title suggests, I believe that if teams of scientists are able to work side by side uh, with industry professionals, community members, and many other stakeholders needed to design, build, and sustain these multiculturally learning communities, then restructuring the built environment and creating resilient communities for today's and tomorrow's climate is actually possible. And if you aren't sure what I mean by multicultural learning community, I hope that you'll uh, know by the end of the 30 minutes, so bear with me. Um, as Dean McAllister mentioned, I am a U of A alum, and I am, uh, feel like I'm coming home today. This I found in the basement. I was really amazed I could find it. On the left is uh, a page from our 1991 college album in the days of photocopying and uh, zip paper. Um, and then on the right is uh, the page of my first research study on the history of women in architecture under the guidance of architecture history professor Abby Van Slyke. So it's really fun to be back at the University of Arizona for this effort. My career map, as you heard, has been a journey through the ins and outs of art and science. The red brackets are careers that focus more on the art or social sciences, and the bracket in blue encap encapsulates my time as an electrical engineer graduate student and neuroscience research scientist. The purple brackets are the times in my career where I have integrated both art and science. Of all the titles I've had, the ones that resonate most with me are designer, facilitator, and artist. Or not artist. <laughs> I, I'm a, I meant scientist. Um, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> um, so at data to insight our team's primary focus over the last 10 years has been to work with science, technology, engineering, arts, math, and medicine. I've added on, so it's STEAM. And, um, and we've worked with leaders and stakeholders to design, develop, and implement programs that are effective at increasing equity, innovation, and impact on the quality of people's lives. So a few examples. Um, this first project uh, is at the University of Washington, and we worked on it from 2013 to 18 uh, with the East Science Institute, which is a pan-university effort uh, that is about creating a data science environment across the campus. And our team partnered with the faculty there who were funded by NSF to develop a data science certificate and PhD program. We uh, take a program theory-driven evaluation approach, which I know from those who completed the survey that many of you are not familiar with. So I'm going to give you a 30-second uh, brief overview of this. Um, so the first step of this is to bring leaders together at the beginning of the project to focus the evaluation by mapping out the program's theory of action and change. What you see here is a map of the short, intermediate, and long-term changes um, that the education and training part of this program was intended to have. And then each year, we answered three evaluation questions driven by the knowledge needs of program leaders and shared the findings with faculty, staff, and students. 
They then use that information to improve the program in the coming year. And we revisit the program theory map each year, refine it based on what was learned, and identify and prioritize evaluation questions for the next year. Faculty and trainees have appreciated how this process helped them better define, design, and develop their strategies and tactics to, act, uh, to achieve program aims. And um, we're able to also provide timely, relevant, and credible evidence that the program activities contributed to the, here you, we've zoomed in on the three to five year changes that are in gold, um, and um, highlighted those. Those are highlighted to show we have been able to provide evidence that the program did, for example, provide for less constrained, deeper, and broader conversations about big data that led to increasing understanding of big data across disciplines. And along the way, what this process does is build a learning community. Another project that we worked on in 2013 and 14 was with UCLA. We partnered with the internal evaluation and tracking team uh, for their Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Um, this is a large scale an initiative across four partner institutions with the primary aim of translating medical research into improved health outcomes for LA County and is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And what we did was we provided practical performance measurement that supported the design and definition of shared measures and a design build of a dashboard using our dashboarding process. We're currently working with uh, the Fresh Water Initiative at the University of Washington, which promotes community interaction and facilitates new and creative application of freshwater research in the water science and engineering communities. And under the leadership of Dr. Bandagaroda, uh, this group received an NSF grant to fund the development of a Water Hack Week, which is a teaching and learning model that's developed by the UW eScience Institute that offers opportunities for science, scientists, engineers, students, researchers, and policymakers to network and build community, learn about state-of-the-art data science methods, and immerse themselves in collaborative project work. We also partnered with this team to strategically recruit a diverse cohort of Hack Week participants and to establish the foundation of a learning community where people interact in culturally responsive ways that supported community building and inclusive innovation. So like the Restruct Built Environment Research Initiative, each of these efforts brought people together from different disciplines, life experiences, and organizations to achieve both research goals and real world impact. And so that's why I'm here. When I shared this work with Dean Bryson at homecoming last month, she invited me to share with you, based on what I've learned about the role of multicultural team science, or multicultural team science which I'll explain in a minute, but really is about interdisciplinary uh, teams, diverse interdisciplinary teams, that could be used as you embark on this exciting journey of restructing built environment research. I did take time to review the material on this initiative and the UA strategic plan, and I really see them as being well thought out and the result of engaging large uh, engagement across stakeholders over the last year. And I'm really humbled to be invited to share with you today my thoughts. Um, I'm here as a fan and somebody who believes that achieving these goals is possible um, if, we can, if you can effectively transfer what we know about designing, building, and sustaining multicultural learning communities into action. And I offer my thoughts on the evidence base for diverse interdisciplinary teams and the barriers to them being successful and what I see as some essential elements for uh, this initiative to uh, thrive. And, and I, can, I, I offer these kind of akin to how um, a design uh, professor might offer their guidance in a design studio setting. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, and um, you can text me questions um, on 206-290-0374. Uh, there will also be time at, at the end for questions. So first of all, what's the case for diverse interdisciplinary teams? And um, what, and first I want to talk about what I mean and kind of how my thinking has evolved on this as I, as I prepared for this talk. So um, 
Thanks uh, for those who took the time to complete the survey. Um, I asked for folks to indicate whether they were somewhat familiar with any of these terms, and what I learned was that half of faculty respond, uh, nearly half of faculty respondents and 22% of industry professionals are at least somewhat what, familiar with the concept of team science, and that 32% of faculty and 43% of industry professionals are at least somewhat familiar with the concept of intersectionality, and over 80% of faculty are familiar with the term transdisciplinary, while less than half in industry are. And uh, third, uh, transdisciplinary research. Um, and 32% of faculty and 17% of industry professionals were familiar with the concept of convergence research. And um, when I talk about, when you think about uh, diverse interdisciplinary teams and what I'm going to kind of evolve it into is multicultural team science. It really, uh, those really include elements, all these elements. So let's start with what I mean by diversity, which I'm going to evolve into multicultural. So racial and cultural diversity exist in the form of many social and personal facets of people's identities. The definition of intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group, create overlapping and interdependent systems of mar creating overlapping and interdependent systems of marginalization and discrimination. This concept was introduced by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw about 30 years ago. And this concept helps us see that everybody has a diversity story, that we are more than only our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our age, or some other category. This diagram uh, is from an exercise that's used to help people explore privilege, power, and oppression, and to appreciate differences as assets. This wheel has different social categories at, that people identify with. Uh, and they include gender, race, or I'm sorry, they include gender, race, national origin, age, first language, and religion, among others. The second wheel has different personal aspects of a person's identity, including birth order and favorite hobbies. Here's my identity wheel. You can see the many facets of my identity, including that I'm a cis woman, white, queer, as well as an avid board gamer. If you think of everyone in this room as having their own identity wheel, you can begin to appreciate how multicultural this or any group of people really are. So what I mean by multicultural is that if a team is multicultural, it embraces these differences and sees them as strengths. It does not create a dominant monoculture where individuals have to figure out how to fit in. Every part of everyone is welcome. So since my first organizational behavior class here in 1990, where I learned that diverse teams solve problems faster and in more innovative ways than homogeneous teams, we've, thanks to that area of research we ha and social, other social science research, we now have a deeper understanding of diversity and personal identity. This research has helped us to see that creating multicultural organizations where everyone's whole self is welcome is vital to discovery, innovation, and high performance. Furthermore, thanks to complexity science, we now have a better understanding of the difference between simple, technical, and complex problem solving and the importance of effective teamwork to solving so-called wicked problems. It's important to note the difference between simple, technical, and complex problem solving. So simple problems are like baking a cake. You know what went wrong when the cake doesn't rise. You left out the baking soda. And when you're solving a complex or technical problem, like sending a person to the moon, that's something that can take a lot of different people's effort to figure out, and sometimes can take a really long time. But once the problem's solved, that solution can be repeated over and over again to achieve predictable success. Complex problems, however, like raising a child, ending, ending homelessness, teaching and learning, or restructuring the built environment and creating resilient communities, those are complex problems and are always unfolding. So even when you have experience solving the problem in one context over a period of time, it does not guarantee success in the future. 
These are the kinds of problems that team science is intended to contribute to solve. So, as again, as I was preparing this, we started with the idea of interdisciplinary teams, and what I realized was that, especially for an initiative like this, we're really talking about team science. Because the National Center for, uh, in, the National Cancer Institute defines team science as a collaborative effort to address a scientific challenge that leverages the strengths and expertise of professionals trained in different fields. Coordinated team investigations with diverse skills and knowledge may be especially helpful for studies of complex social problems with multiple causes. So team science is interdisciplinary by nature. And then there's transdisciplinary research, which is one of the things that is uh, part of the restruct paradigm. And, um, and again, in the survey, you may have seen that most faculty, that was actually the one that faculty, the term faculty were most familiar with, over 80%. But only about half of industry professionals were familiar with that term. And the Harvard School of Public Health defined transdisciplinary research as research efforts conducted by investigators from different disciplines working jointly to create new conceptual, theoretical, methodological, and translational innovations that integrate and move beyond discipline-specific approaches to address a common problem. So this diagram from NanoHub, I thought, I was trying to draw it myself to capture these differences, and I found this, and I thought it did a pretty good job of like trying to visualize those differences, where transdisciplinary, you really, you're having more integration, and you're also bringing in society, stakeholders, and worldview to solve some type of problem. But there's more. So the NSF in 2016 came out with, they identified convergence research as one of the 10 big ideas for future NSF investments. And convergence is mentioned in um, the UA strategic plan as well. Um, and so convergence research is defined as a means of solving vexing research problems, in particular complex problems focused on societal needs. So that, and, it, and basically what they say is that they, we used to think that translational research was the pinnacle of integrative research, but we came up, we decided that convergence, and I'm not sure how this all came about, but that convergence research is really now the pinnacle, um, and uh, for now at least, right? Um, so the things that NSF says are primary characteristics of convergence research are that it's driven by a specific and compelling problem, uh, which has been talked about today, um, the challenges of the built environment and surviving on the planet, and deep integration across disciplines, which also this initiative seems to be really focused on um, creating. Um, so this convergence uh, research idea seems to be in a line with, uh, with Restruct. And so finally, increased scientific impact is another motivation for really leveraging what we're going to now call multicultural team science. Um, and the science of team science has shown that diverse teams of scientists have more scientific impact. This study is one example um, in Nature Communication showing that greater diversity, especially racial and ethnic diversity of authors, increase the number of citations of publications. So the knowledge base, this is the bottom line, the knowledge base for many, from many disciplines exists to support the need for multicultural team science to restruct the built environment. The hard part really is implementing what we know to realize the potential. And so now I'm gonna talk about what are the barriers to multicultural team science and to realizing the promise of this. So the first barrier is the everyday oppressive behaviors within the academy and in industry. Here's a real scenario from a respected research university. Many of you, if not all, probably have similar stories you could tell. During an engineering research team meeting, a faculty starts joking about prostitution for no clear reason. Someone gently steers the conversation back to the agenda. Afterward, two departments heads follow up with the only woman who was in the meeting, another faculty member, they indicate that they're not sure what to do about the comments and ask her for advice. Later, the faculty member who made the comment shows up in her office and ends up crying and asking what he should do. 
As Dr. Anita Hill recently said at an address to the University of Washington, teams and, universe, and teams and organizations' ability to change their everyday behaviors is key to creating truly multicultural teams. Without a learning infrastructure that prepares everyone to be prepared to respond to these types of microaggressions in ways that repair damage, build trust, and help people do better, and uh, behaviors and group dynamics like this will continue to undermine your ability to restruct the built environment every minute of every day. The second barrier is the lack of learning science used to improve teaching and learning in the academy. What we've seen in the work that we've done with universities on interdisciplinary research projects is that there's not enough time and resources typically being spent on improving teaching and learning based on the learning science body of knowledge. In our experience, the NSF and NIH grant proposals typically do not include adequate resources or even require that learning science be brought to bear on new teaching interventions that scientists and engineers are, are testing to develop and train the workforce, to develop uh, the education and training for the workforce of the future. There's a great need to foster reflection and build on what we know works and doesn't work in higher ed in order to optimize STEAM teaching and learning if this initiative is to be able to support the creation of resilient communities. The third barrier that I'd like to identify is the trickle-down funding and measuring the wrong things. So it's kind of a twofer. Um, on funding, foundations and universities are too quick to fund technology solutions and now data science solutions while not adequately funding faculty professional development, student professional development, organizational development, team and community building solutions. This has created a huge gap between researchers' technical abilities and their ability to communicate with different audiences, manage projects, and work in teams effectively. These so-called soft skills are vital to solving the complex problems of our age, and they have been underfunded for decades. And there is also a norm in the academy of inadequately funding community member involvement in research and research application, as well as student traineeships and internships that provide the real world experience needed and the input from the real world for solving real world problems. The thinking goes something like this. We can get them to volunteer and or you know, give their input for free food. This is exploitative behavior. On measurement, every interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and convergence project we have worked on measures publications. And we understand why that's a good thing to be measuring, but frankly, we're typically not very impressed at the quality or accuracy of the measurement, even of that, of the knowledge creation that comes out of these initiatives, in part because they have difficulty determining which publications are attributable to the initiative. And then also there's often, again, a lack of investment in really tracking this and putting a robust measurement process in place. And while the publications are important to measure, community impact is more important if you're talking about transdisciplinary and convergence research. And this is not being measured for some of the same reasons, but also because it's hard to measure and researchers often have not been asked to measure this before. So what's it going to take to move from this uh, traditional science that creates a knowledge base to multicultural team science that creates uh, convergence, that results in convergence research and really solving uh, the real world problems that you're trying to address. So there's a lot. I, I picked my top three. Uh, the first is to create a learning infrastructure for professional development of faculty, students, industry professionals, and other stakeholders that ensures that this initiative's dominant culture is one of learning and improving together. So most, organiza most organizations and initiatives have either a dominant, a dominant culture of control or learning. So it's really important that this initiative have that focus on learning and that the, there's learning uh, and again, we have lots of 
I'm sure you have lots of folks at the, at the university who know how to build this type of learning infrastructure that will result in people being able to have the courageous conversations uh, they need to have and to be able to um, grow and learn from those. Um, one, one simple example of this is at the Water Hack Week that I mentioned, um, we used these norms uh, and introduced those as part of the event. And um, through the evaluation, we heard from women and people of color in particular that because of offering these norms, they were speaking up more and taking more risks on their teams. And, the, uh, and when I talk about uh, learning um, infrastructure, that actually comes from Peter Senge's work um, that uh, became popular in the 90s uh, of the learning organization. And um, this, this definition is a beautiful definition of what a learning organization is. It's a, and um, I love it. But really in short, and, and Peter will say this, is that what it means to be a learning organization is that people are working at their best together. And the learning organization framework and all the associated tools that have been developed for helping people work together at that, their best, I think could be valuable for this initiative. The second uh, key, I think, here is to translate the grand challenges that were talked about today to a shared vision of a resilient Tucson that's held by all community members. We actually had a really interesting conversation at lunch uh, exactly about this. Um, one industry professional and one faculty were talking about kind of their different perspectives on what would amount to success of this initiative. And, um, and I was like, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. And what I think could contribute to bringing them together is to paint a picture of what does a resilient Tucson look like and um, really facilitate um, that process of creating that common agenda. And this, uh, this ability to create this common agenda and common vision will sustain people through the struggle of making the transition to a different reality because this is hard work, right? The stuff I'm talking about is not easy and will take, a, take time and effort and resources um, and is going to be an iterative process. Um, and so um, this is the next. So I asked people about this in the survey. I captured industry professional and uh, faculty responses to the question, what will success of Restruct look like in three years in this mind map? And um, zooming in here, one of the themes that emerged was at the top, we will, seek the we will see the findings of the research incorporated into practice. So what does that look like? I think that's, uh, again, that's what uh, convergence research is about, is that you're using research to solve real world problems. But what does that look like? Um, and how can you explain that in a way that everybody can understand that? And, um, and then be able to measure progress toward that. And then how can you bring stakeholders together to envision what that looks like together? So one of the, um, you may be familiar with World Cafe as a model um, for having these kind of conversations, but there's a whole, um, there's a whole set of uh, strategies and tactics that can be used to bring um, people together around um, these types of topics and to create a vision. So um, the next, and that's, so bringing everybody together, um, it means not only the university, right? And so that's why I use the term learning community, because to really restruct the built environment and create a resilient Tucson, the university cannot do that by itself. A no organization can do that by themselves. So. It will take a community coming together. And Peter Block's uh, book outlines some of the strategies and tactics needed to create experiences of connectedness and caring for the whole that are essential to the success of this initiative. And again, at lunch today, it was really interesting to hear from the faculty perspective and the construction professional perspective and thinking about how could we come up with something that is mutually beneficial. Um, to all the stakeholders. And again, that's not easy. Um, one, somebody said, well, that'll take a decade to come up with that vision. And actually, it doesn't have to take a decade, nor would that, I think, be productive. Um, 
more folks in industry were actually familiar with the collective impact model that answered the survey than folks in academia. And I think this may be because the collective impact is an empirically developed model. Um, and I know some researchers uh, have expressed concern about it. However, I think that researchers from are doing complexity research or anything on complex ad adaptive systems, they, their work, I think, will align with the collective impact framework. And that, the, again, the community that's grown up around this, the tools and resources that are being used by cross-sector initiatives um, to successfully clean up a river or increase uh, high school graduation rates in a region or using all sorts of types of solving all sorts of real world complex problems that these resources also could be valuable, a valuable framework to draw from. And then um, the last is to measure strategy and fund from the bottom up. So um, the first uh, uh, funding suggestion that I, or key I think, is to additional, intentionally invest in integrating learning science into built environment research. I don't know how much this is going on now. I just have kind of re-familiarized re myself with the work here. Um, but again, typically what we're seeing is that the learning scientists, uh, science is not, uh, for teaching and learning is not being adequately integrated into uh, STEAM uh, re research. So, um, and I saw, but I saw that that's an important part of the initiative, so that's really promising. And measure what needs to be improved. Don't just measure what you're good at. So one of the things we're pretty consistently seeing is that when we are working with these initiatives that are funded to diversify the STEM workforce and to try to get um, more underrepresented students into STEM uh, education programs, is that um, the, the PIs will often throw up their hands and be like, you know, we're not going to be able to meet that goal. And then they don't even want to track it because they, they know they're going to fail. But what if you thought about this not as failure but feedback and that you really need to be know what you're not good at and that's what you need to measure the most, not just what you're good at. And then finally, share power with the diversity and inclusion centers to guide initiative funding. So again, to get away from this trickle-down funding, uh, what if you're working with these diversity and inclusion centers from the ground up? They're going to be the ones that are connected to the different area, the different uh, cultural groups. And this also is part of your Hispanic serving institution mission um, and really will allow you to, again, change the traditional paradigm of that trickle down funding that's exploitative of uh, those that have been typically underrepresented in the academy. So those are my thoughts. Thanks for your attention. I hope that they have sparked your imagination about what a restruct multicultural learning community could be. And I hope that this is the first conversation of many as you embark on this exciting journey. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Let me get my phone. Any questions for Veronica? Okay. Well, oh, I was I totally don't, clear. I don't okay. want to. Um, I'm going to turn this on. I know I can do it quickly. There we go. I don't want to uh, uh, come between you and the reception. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to, I do just have a couple of things to say. First, thank you to everyone who has participated as part of the planning uh, and as part of the logistics and as part of the speaking uh, today. And to you all who have attended these uh, sessions and contributed, asked questions, and uh, continued to expand the network of built environment research here at the University of Arizona. It's been a really informative day. It's been an exciting day for me. I hope it's been interesting for you. Uh, for those who, uh, community members, both from industry and from our city and county, who are going to be joining us for tomorrow, 
Uh, please, if you if you don't know what the schedule is, please, um, it's on restruct.arizona.edu, or you can check at the table and uh, get all the information you need in order to be guided well through tomorrow's activities. So don't be shy about that. This is. This last 18 months has been a real adventure, but this is not the end. Uh, the main reason why Betsy Cantwell asked us to do the industry workshop is because she wanted to gauge interest, to put us in a position of being able to learn from our partners outside the university uh, in order to expand and enhance our knowledge of how we can contribute. Uh, and so that means that there's more, more journeys ahead. So we will continue to communicate and let you know what are the next steps uh, over the next few months. And thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the reception.